Thank you for uh, inviting me. Um, I would like to take my time to talk a little bit about open source. So um, I don't know if you guys do much open source in, in school yet, uh, but I guarantee you that you will almost certainly be using open source. In fact, most of you probably are if you're running, if you're using computers, which I assume that you are. Um, you're probably using open source in some way, uh, but I think in your professional life, you'll almost certainly run into it as well. Um, something that's very obviously close to my heart, working at GitHub, um, being an open source developer, doing a lot of open source stuff, and um, I think it's only sort of gaining importance in the world of computing. And <clears throat> being in school, maybe you don't know that much about where it came from or why it exists or how it's important. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about that to, to give you some context. Um, as, as computer professionals, it's going to be a huge part of your lives. Um, and it's, it's really interesting. So in order to talk about the future of open source, I'd like to start with a little bit about the history of open source. So talk about what the term means, where it came from, um, why it's a part of, of our world today. Um, so before I talk about open source, I have to talk about free software. So there's a difference between free software and open source, um, and it's a really interesting uh, difference, I think, and I want to go all the way back to the beginning of, of free software, which is Grace Hopper. So um, this is one of the first sort of documented cases of, of what would be close to a free software project um, is Grace Hopper's compiler, um, and she wrote for the UNIVAC 1. So she wrote a couple of compilers, um, the A0, the A2, and the A2 compiler is one of the first computer programs uh, written and distributed. Um, and it was distributed by the company that she was working for, the Remington Rand Corporation, um, with their UNIVAC 1, which was a huge piece of hardware. And this is them working on it. You can see Grace. You can see um, just a, a very diverse group of people uh, by Silicon Valley standards uh, actually working on the UNIVAC there. Um, uh, and in the early days of, of sort of software, it was given away with hardware because the product was hardware and the software wasn't really valuable by itself. It was so proprietary, it was sort of tied to the machine. Um, and so, you know, it would be like, you know, going out and buying a different engine for your car, right? It doesn't tend to happen because it's sort of built into the car that you're buying, right? Um, but at some point, <clears throat> uh, so they, they were giving away software. And one of the interesting things about the A2 compiler and about these early software projects is that they were given away for free. IBM and DEC and these large hardware manufacturers had software exchanges that they would post software. You could get ver new versions of software. People would contribute back changes, um, and it would be redistributed to future customers um, and to current customers. And this is sort of one of the fundamental principles of what I consider open source software, of what is useful about open source software is this contribution, this collaboration aspect to it, right? And not all open source projects today actually participate in that. Not all open source projects take contributions back from the community. Some of them just sort of give it out, like give it away, throw it over the wall. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the difference there, but point out that some of the very first free software projects um, were actually fairly good open source maintained projects. They took contributions back from the community, they engaged their community, um, and, and the whole community collaborated. So, this started to change. So in the 60s and 70s, um, companies began forming where there was enough of a similarity in the hardware that was being written that uh, you could write software that would run across multiple systems and there was value in the software itself. And so companies started forming that just wrote software. That wasn't, they weren't hardware companies, they were software companies and they would sell software. And since they were selling the software, they would sell it without the source code in most cases, right? So you would just get a copy of the compiled software, you'd be able to run it on your, on your computer um, it would do something great, possibly, you know, it would be great, better than sort of what was, what was distributed with your system, possibly, um, and so you'd pay for it and you wouldn't get the source code. And that started sort of a change in the, the people that were contributing to these systems, right? A lot of the early systems were done at universities, like this, right, where you would get uh, some big computer and everybody would be able to get some time on it and everybody would be able to participate in a larger, more academic type of community with it. Um, when companies started doing it and not giving away the source code, that killed that community, right? Uh, all of a sudden, universities had to pay, in some cases, a lot of money, would not have access to the source code, could not advance computing in the same ways that they were able to before. Um, <clears throat> and so you start getting, you know, 
corporations that start having a more um, antagonistic relationship with hobbyist communities or educational communities where the hobbyists or the educators want to have access to the source code, to learn from it, to make computing better, and that's not in these corporations' best interest. Uh, by the way, the way that I found this image of Bill, this is a letter, sort of a famous letter that Bill Gates wrote to the hobbyist community saying, don't steal my software, don't give the source code away to other people, um, I'm really mad at you, I'm trying to make money here, um, which, was, which was sort of hilarious. <clears throat> this image I, I got by Googling sexy Bill Gates, do not ever do that. This is, <clears throat> this is what I was looking for, but it's not the only one that came up. So. So in response to this, in response to this, guys like Richard Stallman start, this is Richard Stallman of the, of, he works at MIT, um, and started the, the GNU uh, uh, project, which in the early 80s, which was a direct response to this, right? It was because he said, you know, <clears throat> basically, we want to be able to have an open computing system so that everybody can work on it together so that we can all make computing better um, for everybody, right? And we didn't, and, and to, to sort of fight this issue where all of a sudden he was having to ask his university to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for systems that he couldn't learn from and his students couldn't learn from, um, which was not how he had started in computing and, and a lot of his students uh, you know, were sort of used to. So they start GNU <coughs> and he, it, it's sort of this political thing, right? He wants to have access to the source code for the users, the users in this case being uh, software developers, being the people that, that want to have and run the source code. Um, and it doesn't really work that well because it doesn't have a kernel, right? Herd was sort of a big project for a while. I actually ran Herd um, on one of my computers when I was really young. Uh, trust me, it does not work very well. Um, but in 1991, Linus Torvalds comes around and uh, has his Linux uh, source code and, and distributes it for free. And in 1992, he re-licenses it under GPL, um, which is the, the GNU general public license. Um, and so now GNU has an operating system, right? And so from this, as you know, as most of you probably run Linux, some of you probably run it on your desktops, on your laptops, um, probably not all of you, but certainly some of you, um, and almost everybody in this room uses it when they use GitHub, for example, which runs on Linux, and pretty much every other software as a service that you're ever gonna use, um, and probably anything that you build will most likely run on, 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 uh, on Linux. So it expands, it grows because everybody can, and it was horrible at first, right? It was Minix. I don't know if you guys still study Minix in your, you know, in your operating system classes, but it was basically Minix and, and uh, an open version of that, except a really, like, way worse sort of version of Minix. Does anybody know what I say when I say Minix? Is anybody? Okay, just curious. So, um, so, but it improves because everybody can collaborate on it. Everybody can use it. Everybody can add their one thing. And now it's obviously this, this huge thing. So that's why free software, right? Free software started as a response to sort of people finding value in software and closing it down where it was this academic pursuit and people found value in that. People found value in learning from the source code and collaborating with other people that they don't work with or that they don't go to school with um, and advancing computing for everybody. So why open source? So open source is different than free software. Um, it was created specifically as a term. There was a small meeting of people um, and it came out of a lot of uh, things that were written in the Cathedral and the Bazaar by Eric Raymond. If you haven't read this book, it's a very short read. It's online for free. You can buy a copy as well if you'd like to have a, a paper th to read. Um, but a lot of things that, you know, uh, phrases that you may have heard or certainly will hear here at some point, release early, release often, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. These come from this book. Um, and it's a great book, and I highly encourage you to read it. It's really interesting. Um, and it's about his, it's about Eric's uh, comparing the way that, that uh, not proprietary software is written, but the way that a lot of GNU software is written. Um, Richard Stallman writes, e or how, uh, I think Stallman wrote Emacs, how Emacs is written, how these large software projects are written and how they engage with their community versus how Linux engages with its community. So the difference is not proprietary software and, and free software, it's about how different types of free software are written um, but a lot of people have used this to, to this is, you know, the way that the Linux kernel uh, was written, the, the bizarre method, is still one that's sort of 
overwhelmingly used in, in sort of free software today or open source today. Um, but from this, it was very influential in 1997 when it was published. Um, a lot of people read it. it was really, it's really interesting. It's a really good read. Um, but a bunch of people at Netscape wrote it or read it. And uh, in 1998, partially influenced by, by Eric's book, um, Netscape open sources the communicator suite. So this was early browser, early, you know, what is Firefox today, used to be this closed proprietary uh, suite of, of Thunderbird and, Fire, and, and Mozilla Navigator, or Netscape Navigator, and it became Mozilla um, eventually. And it was an interesting time because this is the largest sort of open sourcing of something, of opening source code of, val of software that had tremendous value, right? Com Netscape was a huge, huge company. Communicator was a tremendously valuable uh, asset, and they open sourced this whole Communicator suite partially based on what Eric wrote in that book and, and the sort of the tenets of what we see as, as important to open source today. Um, and, Nets and Netscape open sourcing this led to this strategy session which, um, from which Eric and a bunch of other people were invited in Palo Alto and they all went and sat down and talked about what does this mean? How can we get other companies to do what Netscape did? Um, how can we convince companies to find value in being parts of an open source community and open sourcing the things that they're working on um, for the good of the larger computing community? Um, and, and the way that you can do that, the way that you convince companies to, to, to be involved and not just students and not just hobbyists is to have a pragmatic business case grounds for why you open source stuff, why open source can be valuable to a company, to a for-profit company um, as well. And so they created uh, opensource.org, the OSI, um, which you can go to and find sort of a list of OSI approved licenses. And so all the open source licenses you'll see, there's a lot of them listed here that are sort of standardized. Um, and it's an initiative that, that's been running for about 16 years now. So that was 16 years ago. So in the last 16 years, from going from this sort of uh, uh, free software movement where they're, they're fighting back against the closing off of the community to trying to make it more business friendly. And Netscape sort of leading the way with the, with the Mozilla, the Navigator Suite. Um, there's been a ton that's happened in the open source community, right? From one company open sourcing something to where we are today has been a massive, massive change. But it was a very important change to, to realize that there is a business case to be made for companies being involved in open source. And I think it's really starting to take root in the last couple of years, really, right? It's been 16 years, but in the last two or three, there's been a huge, huge change in, in adoption and in how companies view open source. So now I want to talk about the current state of open source. So luckily, I work at GitHub. I have access to a lot of open source. And so we get to look through it occasionally, and we get to have contests on it. Um, to, and we, all of this, you know, all of our open source data is open, which includes all of the events. So if you, if you guys have GitHub uh, profiles or something, if you log in, you see your dashboard, all those events, everything that's open source or related to an open source project is available publicly. And we have archives of it, terabytes and terabytes of archives of these events. And so we do contests and uh, educator or, or academics will go through and take all that data and crunch it and do papers and stuff on it. So we actually... We actually don't look at this data ourselves very often, but we make it available publicly. Um, Google has actually taken all of it and put it into BigQuery, so you can run BigQuery uh, queries on all of our archived uh, or all of our open source uh, events. Um, and so we learned some really interesting things. So um, I want to go through a little bit about what the open source community looks like today, right? How big is it? Where is it moving? What do the licensing look like? Um, how has it changed from 16 years ago? So. Um, if you want to play along at some point, if you're interested in this type of thing, there's githubarchive.org, which is actually not maintained by us, but um, there's basically all of GitHub's uh, public event data is there, and you can do really interesting things with it. Um, you can download it by day or whatever. Um, there's also ghtorrent.org. Um, and they do a bunch of charts and stuff like this, which are fairly simple, but there's some really interesting data in it. For one, so Java is 14% of, of GitHub's data right now. And there are about 7.6 billion lines of code that have been changed on GitHub um, over the last six years, right? Which is a lot of code. There's a lot of stuff going on uh, on GitHub alone. So GitHub is not the entire open source community, but it is a large part of the open source community. So it's an interesting, I think, uh, slice to look at of, of what open source looks like today. We do a data challenge every year, and there's always interesting things to come out of this where, you know, we give away something small to 
have people go and do visualizations and stuff. And one last year that I thought was really interesting is GitHub. And um, it's online. You can Google for GitHub. And they just basically did a visualization of languages on GitHub. And I think it's an interesting cross-section of what does open source look like today. So, um, so again, 16 years ago, there's a handful of companies that are invested. There's some relatively small projects. There's some larger ones like GNU, like Linux. Um, today, so this is showing us active languages on GitHub. So languages that, that are projects that have had a commit in the last, I think at least one or two commits in the last quarter. Um, and so if it hasn't had a commit in the last quarter, then it drops off the list. And you can go back every single quarter and kind of see. But you can see the active repositories going up. Uh, now it's over 2 million active repositories on GitHub um, within the last quarter. So 2 million repositories that have had public repositories, open source repositories that have had a push within the last quarter, right? So not just sort of sitting there archived. Um, there's about 10 million open source projects on GitHub um, total. Uh, so, but interesting thing, so Java has 176,000 open source repositories on GitHub, active ones, in the last quarter. Python has about 150,000. Ruby has about 135,000. <clears> All the way down to Erlang, sort of at the bottom here, which has 3,000, which doesn't seem like a lot in comparison, but 3,000 like, active Erlang projects, if you've used Erlang, is a lot of Erlang projects that are active. Um, <clears throat> but overall, over 2 million active open source public repositories now, which is, which is huge, which is a huge, huge difference from what it was 10 years ago, right? And even really what it was a few years ago. Um, and it's growing by about 2,000 a day. So every day, there are 2,000 ac more active open source projects than there were the day before. That's 60,000 every month, right? Just on GitHub. Um, there's been papers published about this as well. And one of the interesting things is the Participation. So you have this very huge long tail where the vast majority of, of <coughs> contributors to the average open source project only contribute a handful of patches. You know, zero to five percent of the total of the project is contributed by 75, 80 percent of all of the contributors in total. So there's a handful of people that do a ton of the work, and then a huge long tail of people that do one or two patches is basically what this is saying. And again, that's very different than before especially when you're having books published like The Cathedral and the Bazaar, where the whole point was people will sort of build these walls around the open source project and make it very, very difficult to contribute. And so you'll have very few people that, that sort of have outside contributions outside of the core group. Um, now it's sort of the opposite, where the long tail is providing a ton of, of work in onesie, twosie type patches, which indicates a different type of contributor, right? Not people who take up a project and say, I want to contribute to this project, but people who are using the project in production or using the project in some meaningful way find a bug, and the friction to contributing and to fixing it is so low now that they do it, whereas in the past, I don't think that they generally did, right? It's very easy to contribute to an open source project now. It was a huge pain in the ass even five years ago. Um, Another interesting thing that you're seeing is the proliferation of licenses. So <clears throat> now uh, there's a guy, Aaron Williamson, um, of the Software Freedom Law Center, who did uh, uh, a talk on this and compiled uh, a list of, <clears throat> of uh, statistics on licensing. So he downloaded 1.6 million GitHub repositories and checked them all for licenses. And he found that MIT, which is a much more permissive license than GPL, is by far the most popular license, and we see the same thing. We see that there's about three times as many uh, MIT licenses than any other license uh, on GitHub. Um, we're trying to get better about doing this because when you get down to the end, um, the ma vast majority of projects on GitHub actually have no license at all, right? It's becoming to the point where you have a project or you have a side project or whatever, and you just put it up, especially students, right? You're, you're working on something. You have something that works in your company or, or you know, your student or whatever, and you put it up on GitHub and say, okay, whatever, it's open source. I don't, you know, use it if you want to. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, 80% of, of the projects on GitHub have no license. And it's actually hugely problematic because that means they're within copyright, right, general copyright. And so people can't use them because they have no license. So I encourage you not to do that, to try to, and we try to make it now, we're starting to learn from this, and we're trying to make it easier when you start a new project to have a seed it with a license of some sort um, and have, you know, educate you as to what the different licenses mean, what it means to have MIT or BSD or what it means to have GPL. Um, and we're trying to stay fairly neutral on it because there's a lot of people that are very, have a lot of feelings about, especially GPL, but a lot of people have feelings about licensing, 
and we want, kind of want to stay out of it, but we definitely want you to use a license. So I'll get into why you should open source stuff in a minute, but definitely pick a license, right? If you put something online, please do a license because the only people, I'll get into this as well, but the only people that win, for, uh, so this is a tweet, right? Younger devs today are about <clears throat> post open source software. Screw the license, just put it on GitHub, which is, please do not do this, right? I want to, if anything, if you take anything from this talk, I want you to not do that, right? If you put something on GitHub, if you put something anywhere online as an open source project, please put some sort of license on it because <clears throat> the only people that win from you not putting a license are lawyers, right? Because if somebody, even if it's out there, if somebody puts it into their, into their, their source code and it has no identifiable license, then lawyers get involved and they get to get paid to go through it and look at stuff or do audits and do reviews. And every company eventually has to do this if they're getting big into open source because all of the licenses that have legal claims or legal <clears throat> uh, uh, language in them that make you liable for something, that make you need to do something like GPL, right? And so they need to make sure that you're either complying or the licenses aren't in there um, or those types of licenses aren't in there. So um, I think because of this and because of the fact that so many companies are getting involved in open source now at a degree that has never really been seen before, um, we're seeing less and less of the GPL. So um, because it just, it takes less of your time to worry about whether you're compliant or not, right? If you're using MIT um, or, or a, a, another more permissive license. So we're seeing uh, Redmonk did a, a, a study and throughout basically every language, uh, we're seeing a rise in uh, the ratio between permissive and non-permissive license or per, between permissive and GPL type licensing, um, especially in Ruby Objective-C but even down within Perl, there's sort of downtick in the last thing there, but there, there's still sort of a rise, right? More and more languages, especially ones on GitHub that we're seeing are trending towards more permissive licensing because more, I think, because more companies are becoming involved and companies w don't want to have to deal with, with licensing that they have to worry about. Um, and so that brings me to the involvement of corporations, which I think is another really interesting aspect of the change of open source in the last few years. So there's a list of companies that I know are involved to some degree in open source, that have open source projects that can participate in the open source community. And very few of these, there's a handful of, on, uh, of them on here um, who may have even been involved in, in causing the free software movement in the first place um, that, that have been around that long. Um, that are now involved in open source, that open source stuff, and, and are involved in the open source community. And if anything, they're pushing the opposite direction of getting medium-sized businesses into open source because they see you know, Oracle or Google or Microsoft involved in open source, and so they see that as being valuable, right? Um, whereas before, it was almost the opposite, right? Where, where some of these guys were huge anti-players in, in sort of the open source world. Um, if you look at the Linux kernel, I think it's really interesting that everybody sees this as a large you know, successful open source project that everybody here is using in some way or another. And that's true, um, though one of the interesting things about it is, is Linux kernel uh, does um, a report every year on, con on contributors to the open source or to the Linux project. <clears throat> and interesting, interestingly, less than 14% are done by people not working under corporate sponsorship. So <clears throat> about 80% of the Linux kernel is written by people being paid to write software for the Linux kernel. Um, in fact, you can find Microsoft employees contributing hundreds of commits to the Linux kernel. So just remember that when you're running Linux on your laptop, uh, you're running Microsoft code. <laughs> um, it's actually, I think, mostly for Azure and, and Hyper-V and stuff, but so you may not actually be running it. But you could be. Don't know. You don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, so libgit2 is uh, an open source project that actually I kind of helped start to some degree. Um, and we use heavily GitHub. We run most of the actual Git commands that you see, you know, when you see lists of files and stuff that all runs libgit2 in the background now, um, instead of fork execing out to, to Git processes. But um, it's a pure C reentrant library implementation of Git so that you can wrap Ruby or Python or whatever and run Git commands um, through, through that are very performant um, through scripting languages or through, through C, which you can't really do with, with Git. But anyways. Uh, so GitHub uh, started, basically started this project and funded it for a while um, because we wanted to be able to use it. Um, and then Microsoft actually came to us um, because this was so far along and it was getting pretty good and they wanted to embed Git into Visual Studio. So if you download Visual Studio now, it comes with uh, whatever their proprietary one is. I um, can't remember. Source safe? 
source safe. Um, and Git, it has Git integration built into it as well. Um, there's like a little Git sidebar stuff, and that's all libgit too. And so before that happened, about a year before they released that, they came to us and you know um, we started working with them. So they had a handful of four or five full-time developers that were just working on libgit two with us. So basically all of libgit two, if it's open source, it's GPL licensed with a linking exception. Um, if you download it and use it for anything that you want to now, it was basically 90% developed by GitHub and Microsoft uh, in, in collaboration, which I think is sort of a fascinating story, actually. If you had asked me three years ago, uh, do you think you and Microsoft would be working on like an open source project uh, the, around Git, I would have slapped you in the face. Um, <laughs> so um, definitely the, the, the world the ecosystem of open source has been changing a lot. Um, and that's one of many stories of, of companies like large corporate companies being involved in open source projects that you all can use commercially in, in whatever you do when you leave college, right? Um, so the business of open source. So this is sort of where I sell you on open source, right? I want you to do open source. I want you to, when you get a job or if you already have jobs, to look at the source code that you're, that you're building and try to ask yourself, does it make sense to open source this, right? Um, GitHub, we have, github.com is not open source, but we have hundreds of libraries that are open source. Um, our Windows and Mac clients are not open source, but all of the technology that they're built on, there's probably a dozen libraries in each one that are open source. So if you wanted to build GitHub or if you wanted to build uh, your own client, your own Git client, you don't have to start from scratch, right? You can use all the stuff that we've already built and you build your own UI on top of it or whatever, and it's, it's a tenth of the work that we've had to do. Um, so why is that even a thing that a business would do? Why is that helpful? Um, so, why do businesses use open source? Why do they open source at all? So one is, there's a couple different reasons why it's helpful to use open source, to be involved in the open source community. One is, you want to use open source. So, if you use open source, it's way more effective to contribute back than it is to just take the open source and try to make proprietary changes to it and then run it yourself, right? Um, the reasons mostly are because if the open source project is live, if it's active, right, if it's Android and you fork it, you don't get anything else that happens in Android without having to backport everything that you've done, which makes, it's, it's a huge, huge nightmare, right? The longer and older patches get, the harder it is to backport them to, to the newer stuff that comes out. So if you get them upstreamed, then you don't have to worry about it anymore. The community helps take care of that code with you, right? And, and you don't have to continuously backport all your stuff. So this is something that we do with Git itself. We have GitHub hires, I think we have three, two or three full-time people that just work on Git, um, mostly just open source. They just write open source Git 90% of the time. Um, they will look at use cases we get. It turns out GitHub has a lot of Git, use, or, you know, Git usage, um, and so we find most of the race conditions and edge cases in Git, um, and then these guys will find them, fix them, and then upstream them so everybody gets to use them. So all of our, none of our competitors have to deal with the, the, you know, the use cases that we run into, which is really nice. Um, but we don't have to keep those patch series going. Um, finding and attracting developers is another useful one. So trying to find people to hire is very useful if they're in the domain space that you're in. If you are a MongoDB developer or something and that's really what you're interested in and you provide patches to it, it's really useful for somebody looking for MongoDB developers to look through people that are working in the same domain space and work with them. We've hired a couple of people um, on Atom, for example, which is our text editor that's open source, because they were really big contributors and they were in sort of the space that we wanted somebody and so we would offer them jobs. Uh, LibGit2, same way, right, or, or Git. Like, we found a handful of, of people, and sometimes they transfer to other places within the company or whatever, but it's very useful for companies to find people by open source. Um, working across fields, so this is another really interesting thing about open source, which is something that you never really saw in business before, I think it's something that's fairly brand new, which is companies are now working together on shared problems, right? So we work with a number of companies on improving Ruby core performance. Um, so we have Ruby de core developers um, that work at GitHub that are trying to make GitHub faster, but so are people at Twitter and so are people at, you know, X number of other companies that are running Ruby on Rails installations or Ruby code in some way. And so we find bugs, they find bugs, we talk to each other and we try to help improve Ruby together, um, which if everybody's running on proprietary software, doesn't happen, right? The only time that you would get sort of cross 
work like this, where companies you know, would learn from each other, is if people leave a company and go work for another company, and then you get to learn from everything that they learned at their previous company, which I think was very, is still actually very common. But this is a really interesting side benefit of open source, is that you get to really deeply work with people on core problem sets. Um, at, with, with other companies, right? We get to learn from Microsoft by working with them on LibGit2, and we have learned from Microsoft, and they've learned from us, and I think that's a really interesting collaborative aspect where we don't have to hire people from my, Microsoft to learn how they do stuff or what their problem sets are, um, or vice versa, right? Um, we can do it through, through our, our common open source uh, interests. Um, and engage the community in their other projects. So there is a lot to open source that businesses have to, uh, to, to gain from using it, and which is why I think you're seeing all of these companies starting to use open source in a much more significant manner. So now I'd kind of like to talk a little bit about the future. So where does this lead us, right? Where do we see this going? What, what, are you, what open source world are you guys going to be walking into when you leave here? Um, or are you possibly already involved in? So one is... I think there is a trend of corporate corporations being involved in open source. I think, if anything, people are not paying as much attention to it as they should right now. I think most people, especially people of my age, um, you know, in their 30s or something that were involved in open source in the, the earliest days of these, um, still sees open source as like a hobbyist community, right? We still see Linux to some degree as like a hobbyist or, or a corporate free environment, right? Where it's all freedom and roses and daisies and beautiful. Um, and I think it is beautiful, but it is definitely not corporate free, right? Like most of Linux kernel is written by corporations these days. Most of a lot of significant open source is written by corporations or written by people work that are working for corporations these days. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think there's a ton of experience and expertise and really smart programmers that are in companies like Microsoft and in companies like Oracle that have not been able to participate in the larger open source community before. And we all are benefiting from that now. And we really were not five years ago. Um, so I think that as people become more comfortable with this and as people embrace this and as corporations become more comfortable seeing everybody else do it and being like, okay, we'll open source these things um, and really try to... Microsoft is another great example is recently they uh, open sourced the .NET CLR stuff, right? So a lot of Microsoft.NET language is on, on GitHub now and within a month, uh, they, ha they now, with I think the last month, had more external contributors to the .NET language runtime than internal contributors, which it was only a Microsoft project before, and now more people are, ex are contributing to it externally. So they're, they're being actually really good uh, open source maintainers in many aspects, and I think there's, it's, it's fascinating. It's really interesting. So I think we'll start to see more of this, more companies involved in open source, and us gaining more from that as well. And so, you know, if you're getting a job in outside of academia when, when you graduate, I, I think and I hope that open source will be a part of that, right, no matter where you go. Um, the other interesting thing from just a business standpoint, so from a, you know, from starting GitHub, from, from watching it grow from sort of four people to 270 something now, um, to see, I think there's going to be a, a huge difference in how people work. Um, because one of the things about GitHub is that before I, I work at GitHub, there's a huge difference between an open source workflow and a proprietary workflow. And in a lot of com companies and organizations, it's still like this. Um, within GitHub, because we all started as open source developers working on something that was primarily used by open source developers, um, we worked in a more open source manner, right? So we mostly work from home. GitHub is about 60 or 70 percent remote. We have employees in probably 30 something states in maybe 15 or 20 countries in the world. And we're not even that big of a company, really, 200, 250, 270. So, um, and part of that is because we worked like open source people. That's how we were used to working. That's how we continue working. That's how the whole company works to the, for the most part, right? Is having asynchronous, uh, you know, working asynchronously, um, having URLs for everything, um, uh, you know, doing as much online as we can and, and as little in person as possible. Um, and I'm, I think that we're starting to see a convergence in how open source workflows work and how proprietary workflows work, especially as you're starting to see more companies using the same tooling, using GitHub, right? If you're using GitHub on your open source projects and you're using GitHub inside your company or you know, even our competitors which use the same types of workflows, um, 
there's not as much of a difference as there was between, say, subversion and perforce or something that you had in the old days, right? Now, you're using Git in both places, you're using the same tools in both places, and so the work, it's, you're starting, people are starting to question, why do we do it this way in the open source world, but a totally different way in the closed source world? Why do we have stand-ups, you know, stand-up meetings in person, and everybody works in the same office every single day in the proprietary world, but then we work on open source with people all over the world, and we're getting very similar types of problems solved, right? Why, why can't we do that in our company? Or um, you know, are there things from, that we're doing in our company, good design, good documentation, that we can bring into the open source world? So um, I think that the worlds are starting to, to come together and to be more similar, and I think it's good for both worlds, right? Um, so yeah, a couple of those things. More remote, I think we'll start to see more remote work as, it starts, as people start to realize that, that the, the, there are advantages and disadvantages to working remotely, but I think that there are way less disadvantages than people assume that there are. I've been working remotely for six months now. I feel like I'm still, we, most of our company works remotely and we're able to do a lot of really amazing things with actually a really huge group of people that, that are still able to work in one direction and, um, and get big things done even though nobody's in the same room or even in the same time zone often. Um, I think if that starts to happen and we start seeing more companies say, you know what, I don't care where you, where you live, we'll figure out how to make this work remotely, then you don't have to pay for big offices, you don't have to bring everybody to one location, which is expensive for everybody. San Francisco, Paris, London are ex insanely expensive places to, to live and work now because everybody, all the big companies want you to live there. If it was up to you, you know, you can live wherever, you can live here, you can live places that don't cost as much as those centers and be able to have your life that you live in work more, you know, live more cheaply, but still be able to be just as useful in your, in your corporation, right? And I think some corporations are starting to see that and starting to realize that, and as open source comes through them, which I think is inevitable, um, it'll be harder to, to, to question those or to find fault with the, the open source style of working. Um, and so I think that'll, that'll end up resulting in fewer cost of living issues. If you don't have to live in San Francisco, and you don't really like San Francisco, then why would you pay twice as much to live there, right, if it doesn't really matter? Um, three times as much to live there. Uh, <laughs> um, fewer meetings, less email. So this is another thing. We don't use email in GitHub because there's no URL. So I will probably get, uh, I don't know, two emails a week maybe from somebody else that works at GitHub. They're usually personal or HR related, um, stuff that we don't want URLs for. But for the most part, everything goes in GitHub issues, even our legal team, our HR team, um, people that are not technical within GitHub use GitHub issues for stuff because there's a URL, right? Any conversations that we're having uh, like across groups, any conversations we're having within teams, we do it with something that has a URL because if, you do, if you're sending emails to, to people within your company um, and somebody else starts the next day, if you don't have like a public archive or something, there's no way, even within open source projects, it's really hard to have canonical URLs for emails when they're, even when they're email based. So we try to avoid emails at all costs or anything that doesn't have a URL that you can, when the next person that joins your team, you can say, here's a list of URLs, go read all of this stuff and you'll have context, right? As opposed to trying to learn it by osmosis. Um, um, finally, or not finally, but the death of copyleft. So I don't, I loved copyleft when I was younger. I still think that there's a place for it. There's still stuff that we do that's under GPL, um, but we are seeing it decline, right? And I think because of this involvement of corporations. So a common thing that I used to hear a lot was, would you buy a car with the hood welded shut? And my answer is, if it's this car, I will buy that car with the hood welded shut. <laughs> Um, I used to run Linux on stuff. I still do in, in some cases, but you know, I mean, how many of you have Macs, right? This is, this, this fucking hood is welded shut. Like, I don't know if you've tried to change anything on a Mac or on your phone, but the hood is welded shut now, right? That's not what's important right now. That's not what's important anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't prevent you from developing from the platform or learning from the platform in the same way that it used to. So, um, uh, and also I suck at cars, so I wouldn't be able to fix it anyways. I, you can open the hood, I, I fucking, I can't, I don't know what's going on in there. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, what does copyleft do? So more and more in my world, what I'm seeing um, is what copyleft is, is primarily helping is lawyers. Most of the conversations that I have with people over copyleft now are with lawyers or with legal departments because uh, we have to hire them to go through our code base or to do audits or to show to investors or whatever um, that we're not using GPL code or way in, in ways that might you know, come back to bite us in some, in some manner. And we never have that conversation with MIT code. We do have that conversation with non-licensed code. So we have had to go out to projects that we want to use that don't have clear, clear licenses 
and send them a pull request with an MIT license or something and, and say, can you merge this so that we can use your stuff, right? Um, so that, that does happen. I think that will continue to happen. Um, but since nobody likes lawyers to win, uh, we are starting to see, I think, um, the, the, the increased use of permissive licensing to try to make it so that, I mean, nowadays, the, the, it's not freedom from fear. That's, this is what free software was about, right, and is about, is freedom from fear, right? Um, and, and, but I want freedom from fear from legal issues or not having to worry about licensing at all. Um, and I think a lot of people are like that as well, and so that's, I think, why you're starting to see it. I, I suspect that it will continue going in that direction. Um, what do we want from open source? So what is it that we really want, right? Back to first principles. What are we looking for from open source? We're looking for freedom from fear, right? We don't want to have to worry about uh, using this software or how we can or can't use this software. We simply want to use it to understand it and to contribute to it if we want to. Um, we want the ability to improve and learn from cutting edge software, right? This is why, this is why software was open in the first place. This is why I find value in open source software is so that I can get in there, I can learn it, I can teach it, I can help other people understand it, and I can improve it if there's something that I'm capable of, of uh, some way in which I'm capable of improving it. Um, and we want to collaborate with people in other companies on commodity software. So the commodity part is, is important. Um, what I think the most useful open source is, is commodity software. So I don't think open sourcing github.com would be valuable for almost anybody, right? But open sourcing libraries that you could use to build the next anything that has any aspect of GitHub in, in common, right? Drivers for databases or that you might be using that we're also using, or libgit2 if you're trying to use git for something, right? You should absolutely open source that. If it's a commodity, if it's something that a ton of different businesses could find value in, then open source that. If it's your main product, maybe don't, right? I mean, it's entirely up to you whether you find that valuable or not. We don't, and so we, there's a lot of things we don't open source, but there's hundreds of projects that we do. So look at the projects that you're working on and ask yourself, is there a good reason not to open source this, right? Does this actually provide us with competitive advantage or help us in, our, in what we're trying to do as a company, or can we involve ourselves in the larger open source community? Um, the last thing that I really want to talk about is what do we mean by open source? So I had this conversation earlier with uh, Steve, who I think is talking in a couple of days, um, where op the concept of open source or the term open source is sort of ambiguous, right? Do we mean the availability of the source code, right? Is, that's what, is that what is important about open source as a project? Is it the right to use it for anything, right? Do we have to worry about the constraints in which we have to operate this, this source code? Is it the right to contribute back and improve it, right? So there are a number of open source projects that are open source because they are under a license and they, the source code is freely available, but they are not, they don't, you're not really allowed to contribute back, right? You're not really invited to improve the project. So if you look at Android, for example, is an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting one. Somebody else brought up, um, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of, uh, oh, anyways, Android's fine. So if you look at that, it's really a thrown over the wall type product, right? You get access to the source code, but it's a couple months behind. So you can look at it, you can see how it's working, you can provide bugs, but the path for contribution is very obscured or muddied or impossible in, some, in cases of some other open source projects where they take something that they're working on internally, they put it on GitHub or they put it somewhere externally and they say, ta-da, it's open source, but if you want to fix it, it's basically impossible to fix it because there's no good path into, it's not the source code system that they're using, it's the mirror of it, right? And so they throw it at you, they say it's open source, but you, it's not really the same thing, right? What we're interested in and what I think you need in order to have a really good open source project the way that I think of open source and the way that I think is healthy for the community to embrace open source is to have that path back, right? To have it be an actual community. Um, so my personal, belief is that freedom isn't enough, right? It isn't, it isn't enough to be free. Um, what we've, I, I've thrown this around internally and actually Steve totally separately in the conversation that we were having today said community open source was how he refers to this type of software where a separate de designation for software where 
um, you have that you're a good open source maintainer, right? Back to sort of Grace Hopper. Like you, you put it out there, but then you also look for con contributions. You engage with the community. You help nurture your community. You're not like, you're too dumb to contribute to this, which some communities are like that. Um, you try to help them grow. You try to help them be involved. You help them write good patches. And then you, merge, you help get them merged in. And you, con you continue that cycle. If you look, if you go to the .NET CLR uh, Microsoft open source webpage and you look at their pull requests, there are maybe... The last time I looked at it, zero, zero to two open pull requests and like 560 closed ones, right? So they process them, they look at them, they have conversations, they merge them or they close them, but they process them, right? They engage with their community and they're really, really fantastic at it. And if you look at some other ones, for example, uh, any open source project that I have run in the last few years, there are a whole bunch of open project or open pull requests and I'm not that good at doing it. And so what I try to do is pass it off to somebody that is when I don't have the time to do it anymore. But there is a huge difference between being a good open source maintainer and having a community and engaging and being a good open source project, which you know I like to call community source or community open source or something, but some designation of there's a difference between just being open and being collaborative or being inclusive. Um, uh, so clear and permissive license. CLA is something that I'm still having debates about with people. Um, I don't know if that's necessary or not, but there are contributor license agreements that some companies want to, to have. But making those easy if you do, if you're lawyers, and usually you have to be, you have to be in a company that has lawyers before you worry about CLAs for your open source stuff. But if your lawyers really think that's important or per project or whatever, but having some clear and permissive um, license and way of knowing that if you contribute uh, back to a project, what your rights are and what the rights of the company are for that code. Um, having clear contributing guidelines and trying to make them standardized. So I, I say GitHub Flow, which, which we use internally to talk about forking, contributing, sending a pull request, uh, merging or closing, right? Having that type of flow. So most of our, it doesn't have to be GitHub necessarily, most of our um, uh, uh, people that are in the same space as us do the exact same thing, like they have the same types of workflows. But not, if you looked at, if you tried to contribute to open source in the early days, every, every open source project had a slightly different way of doing it, right? Now, try to, try to do what is sort of the, the standard, right? Be responsive, help people, be prepared to give up projects if you can't do this, right? So that one's important as well. If, whoa, reflexes like a cat. Okay. Um, <laughs> So I'm getting to the end of my time, but uh, be prepared to give it up. So if you look at an open source project and that open source project, even if they are doing these other things, if, if they would not be prepared to give up the project, then I feel like it's not really an open source project, right? If it is so ingrained in the company that owns it that there, you can't see a future and they can't see a future where they would give it over to somebody that would be a better steward, then I feel like it's not really an open source project. Um, so, or a community source project, right? Some, some, some higher definition of this. Um, so, final point, I feel like community source is not about free as in speech, right? You hear about free as in beer, free as in speech. I'm not entirely, like, free as in speech is great, right? It's nice to have freedom of speech to stand on the corner and, and sort of yell out into the, the, the community like a crazy person and not be arrested or something, right? That's awesome to have that, that freedom, but it's better to be able to sit down at a table with a, a political representative and have somebody listen to you and have something done about it, right? So freedom of speech is great, but being invited to participate is, is much more interesting. And, and that's, what I, that's where I think open source is headed, um, and that's where I want to see it go. Um, so not free as free in speech, but free as in we're listening, right? Free as in please join us. So what can you do? Um, so again, Look at the stuff that you're working on. When you get out into the corporate world, look at the stuff that you're working on. Try to bring up these questions, bring up these points. Ask yourself, can your company be involved in open source? Can the stuff that you're working on be open source projects and engage the larger community so that everybody benefits, including yourself and your company? Um, and uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. Um, this is a quote that I really like that had to do with politics, um, which goes back to the, sort of the freeze in speech. Um, this was given at a political, uh, a political conference that I went to on, on technology and politics, um, talking about how politics, instead of being a dirty word, could be what it meant in the original Greek, the engagement of all citizens in the decisions that affect their lives. Um, and that's what I think is important about the future of open source is that it's about the promise of engagement. So that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs>
All right, so uh, do we have some Q&A time? Yes, I think that's a yes. Hello. Uh, my impression is that GitHub's business model is about the, the hosting of private repositories, and there are already open source projects that also do that, it's GitLab or Gitorious. So the obvious question for me is, why is GitHub itself, the core, open source? Why, why isn't it open source? Uh, well, again, because we don't gain anything from it, except, because we, we wouldn't, so, actually, that's a great question. Why not open source something, right? Um, and we have this debate internally a lot um, about, we've actually debated open source and github.com a lot. Uh, or, or other models, you know, where if you're a, a paying customer or something, you get access to this, some aspect of the source code or something. I mean, there's lots of different models that you can do that we've seen other companies do. Um, and basically, the only reason we don't open source stuff is if, if we think that there would be value in having contributions um, is if we think, um, that we wouldn't be prepared to be good community maintainers, right? If we would not be prepared to have conversations with people, this was a huge thing with Adam. We wanted Adam to be closed source for most of the development of Adam, and we changed our mind at the last minute um, to, to open source it because we felt in the end we were, of, we would be available. We would want to spend the time and resources to have to, you know, to close all the pull requests to come in and to try to maintain the community well. Um, I think for GitHub.com because there's no value in it for you. It's a huge pain in the ass to run it yourself. There's not that much that you, I mean, our stack is insanely complicated. It would be very difficult for us to simplify it to the point where you could run it like a GitLab thing where that was, that's been sort of their, their point from the beginning. Um, and how much does it add over GitLab if you really want to maintain your own everything, right? Um, and and make, make, make your own proprietary changes that aren't necessarily, you don't have, you don't have to uh, upstream them or anything. There's a ton of problems involved in like running your own software that we, there was nothing in it for us, it was not valuable, and it would have only made people's lives more difficult basically by us not being prepared to support that, right? Um, and not really being, we, we have a design vision for our product and we're not really open to sharing that with people and we don't wanna hurt people's feelings by telling them no, um, which is another huge reason why we haven't open sourced the desktop clients where um, I think I argued uh, early on for the desktop clients to be open sourced because I think that it would be good and I think that we, should, like, like Adam, I think we should engage the community in helping improve those. Um, but the teams don't, don't want to deal with that, right? They, so they open source 30 plugins and they have big communities on those and they feel like they can deal with that. But having design decisions and, and you know, on the main product itself is in insanely difficult to do. So it just, it just depends on your team, like what they're prepared to, to do. Like I, I also don't even know for GitLab or, or for Gatorius, um, which I didn't even know was highly used anymore, but um, like what, what is the open source community? If you contribute to that, is that up to you or do they actually take your, your contributions, right? Can anybody do it? That's another thing, right? Is if I can add any feature that's really specific to my company and that does get made, like upstreamed, if they have no taste, then that, that hurts everybody, right? So uh, I don't know, it's super difficult. But I would say the easy choice is libraries is stuff that, uh, that is not competitive, right? Related to the previous question, uh, one of the main concerns for developers and companies is um, if I want to make this application or this library open source, how will I monetize it? Uh, I wanted on your opinion on that. Yeah, I mean, we've never tried to monetize anything open source that I can think of. Um, so I would say if, you're, if there is a concern of monetization, then like, I, I can't help you there because we've, like, anytime that there's, like, Adam, we decided to open source <clears throat> because, you know, we were not concerned with the monetization of it specifically, right? We wanted to monetize it at first, which was kind of why we developed it in the first place, and then it got to a point where we really just wanted it to be successful. Like, we wanted a lot of people using it. We wanted an open source editor that we, we wanted to use internally, and we decided for the amount of money that we could make off of it if we made it proprietary was not worth, uh, you know, it was worth more to us to have that, that 
editor be open source. And so we have basically no monetization plans for it. Um, so I think unless you're, ma you're making that decision of we're not going to try to make money off of this, it's going to be very, very difficult, or I can't really help you. I mean, you can do like support, things like that. There are a lot of companies like Red Hat that have a lot of open source stuff and make money on support and services. Um, MongoDB, you know, is a good example. There's, there's a ton of open source companies, but GitHub's not one of them. So I'm not, I'm not helpful really there. Um, I, I'm, I'm more interested in the companies that have proprietary products that don't want to open source anything, right, into trying to get them into the open source game and try to look at, it, like, instead of zero or, or everything, what is a middle ground? Like, what is, the, what is the, the path to getting involved in open source? So as you were, I actually got two questions. As you were saying, there are more people working remotely. It seems to me that uh, there's a shift of uh, being paid by working for hours than to be uh, being paid by working for value. Uh, what are some good uh, measurements to um, to gauge uh, how uh, how how valuable an uh, uh, employee is? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I wish I had more answers for these really, really good questions. Um, so we've changed the way, th so we, we, yeah, you're right. We uh, pay everybody, basically, the way that we originally did it, we did it was we would pay people, so everybody's on salary, basically. We only have a handful of contractors at GitHub, and so we would pay them based on what they asked for. Um, so we tried to make it more of like, uh, you know, what people need, because people were living in all sorts of different places, had all sorts of different things, really what we wanted was for people to not have to worry about, you know, their income to, to make what they felt was fair and that they could, they could live on and that they felt that they were being remunerated properly. Um, and so we let them tell us what they wanted to make and most of the time we would just say yes to that. Um, or if it was too low, if we felt it was too low, we'd bump it up, if anything. Um, and so, it worked out fairly well in most cases. It didn't work out in the cases of people that didn't value themselves as highly as they probably should have or didn't, didn't have a more competitive spirit of trying to, to you know, fight for more money or wanted to work at GitHub and so they, would, you know, they were giving themselves a pay cut to, to make themselves, to, in their eyes, feel, seem more valuable or something. So there's pluses and minuses to that. Like in my case, I want, I want our employees to be happy, right? I want people to not have to worry about paying the bills and stuff like that because that distracts you from getting your work done. Um, we've, it's difficult in both cases. So we've started to move more towards your uh, level one or level two engineer or whatever, right, to try to have more fairness throughout the company because that breaks down when people start comparing their salaries and they're like, why do you make that and I make that? It's because you asked for different things when you started, right, not because we value you differently. Um, it was more about what people value themselves as rather than what we value them as, which I thought was more fair, but when people compare it, they're not fair, you know, when people aren't fair to themselves, then, then it's problematic. So um, we've started in the last year trying to normalize it to some degree and doing it by tier of city and things like that. And then it's really based on your peers, right? So we do more peer review. So it's not just output or lines of code or, uh, you know, whatever projects completed or something. We ask the people that you work with every day, like, how is this person doing? We do like a 360 review type thing and try to get feedback from everybody because, you know, if you're working four hours a day but are amazing and are hugely valuable to the team, then you'll get good review, especially because nobody can see when you're working, right? I mean, if you're dropping code and you're getting things done and you're communicating when you need to and you're available for some part of the day, um, nobody's even going to know that you worked four hours or you worked 20. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to anybody. What matters is what you're doing. And so, in the end of the day, when most people are remote, especially our engineering teams, um, it, you know, it, it, it's important to ask the people that you're working with for a subjective review, right? How important is this person to what you're doing? How hard would it be to lose them? Or, you know, how, how much do you think that they contribute? And it has to be totally subjective. So I wish there was a better way to do it, but there's, we've tried a bunch of different ways, and there's, there's always downsides to some way of measuring people, right? Okay, thank you. I just had another second question. Uh, tabs or spaces? What? Tabs or spaces? Oh, uh, spaces. <laughs> Come on. Okay, sure. <laughs> Do you want to shout it and I can repeat it, maybe? 
which point is free, really free? For example, uh, Google softwares, uh, for example, Android or uh, Pepper I API, um, they are free, open source and such things, but in some ways they tend to, to block people to, to their, their systems, to do not allow them to go to somewhere else. For example, uh, Pepper APIs such as Flash. Uh, I use Linux and sometimes people criticize Mozilla and the other browsers for not supporting Pepper API because Flash uh, is way better on Pepper API than on NP API. Uh, and the answer I often find is because Altru uh, Pepper API is open source, it is not well docu documented and Google uh, like uh, saves it for for themselves for people to use Chrome and some same thing on Android. Google Play uh, is like a must to use Android. People uh, can't really get away from Google Play unless they use hacky things such as Black Mart and such things. It's there's no way to avoid them. Is that really free? Ultra V is open source. <coughs> well, I mean, you're free and you can choose not to use them, right, if you don't, <laughs> like, I mean, you, you, it's all a spectrum of, of what you want out of software, right? You can go live in the woods and not use technology at all, or you can choose to avoid, you know, Google entirely if you think that they're a big, bad behemoth, or, you know, you can choose to not watch, you know, videos that require Flash, or, I mean, there's a, there's a huge spectrum of uh, you opt into sort of the market, right? So I think that, you know, in general, if if something's open source and they're not supporting it, if it was proprietary, they wouldn't be supporting it more. They would probably just shut it down, right? So at least if it's open, you have a little bit more freedom than you would have if, if it were not. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, again, these are all corporations that are trying to figure, not all corporations, but the people are, companies or whatever that are trying to figure out how to engage with the market, how to provide value for people, how to engage with their developer communities or, you know, sort of the, the secondary markets of, of people that they want to engage in. So I, I don't know, like, if it pisses me off enough, then I won't use it. Like, I don't listen to Tw Taylor Swift because I'm really mad that she's not on Spotify. So <laughs> I feel like I'm losing in that proposition because it's great music, but I made that decision because, because, you know, that's the decision that I made. So I, I feel like open source proprietary software, like, it's like that as well. If, if you feel strongly enough about it, you can abstain and, and try to have your voice counted in that way. But it's up to you whether that's, it's more or less valuable to your life. Um, there was another one over here, I think. And I think, I think we're, that's it, right? Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I understood the main difference between free, free software and open source. So in free software, uh, the user has the choice to like control the software to make the changes he wants. And open source, there's like a project where everyone can contribute. So, so basically, the free software movement is predicated on using the GPL, on using copyleft licensing. So in, in GPL or copyleft licensing, if you use the software and you modify it, anything that you use it with, anything you write on it, in order to distribute it, you have to, you have to make it open source as well. So it has a, a virality to it, right? So you can't use, uh, you can't use you know, GPL libraries if they don't have a linking exception, which libgit2 does, um, unless, or you can, unless you use LGPL or something. But it is, it, may, it, it is made, it was designed to try to say, if you want to use this software and you want to write stuff on top of it, you also have to open source that software, right? Where the other licenses, the open source, so those are open source licenses as well. Open source is broader. It tries to make free software more generic, right? By, by having inclusive software practices um, so that people are sharing their source code in, a, in other licensing manners. And, and by permissive licensing, I mean licenses that don't have those clauses, where if, you, if there's an MIT library, you can take it, you can bundle it with your proprietary software, you can even make changes to it, and you can sell that and never give anybody access to the source code. Right? You can do whatever you want with it. Whereas with the GPL stuff, with the free software movement, you can't. If you want to use their software, you have to open source your stuff under their license as well. That's, that's what free software is. Oh. Yeah. Okay, 
Okay. Do we want to do one more and then we'll... Uh, last question. Okay, last question. And then uh, I'll be up here for a while if anybody wants to talk about anything, other, anything else with GitHub or business or whatever as well. Uh, I can talk about more than just open source too. Yeah. You mentioned uh, licensing and cases where people didn't choose any license. Um, I think that's because probably people don't understand the differences like you were just uh, explaining about GPL. Um, I've noticed there are several different uh, versions of the same license and there are many, many licenses. Yeah. Um, do you think, uh, w what kind of, what, so what solution do you have for that uh, in GitHub since uh, it is so popular yeah. uh, for people that open new projects? Yes, so licensing is, can be very complicated um, depending on what you're trying to get out of it. We put up a website called choosealicense.com, I think, or choosealicense.org, I can't remember. Um, but when you start a new project in GitHub, it has you, uh, it has you choose a license if you want us to generate the, the first commit, sort of the, the main thing. And we link to choosealicense.com to help you choose. And that has it very simplified so that you can figure out what you're looking for um, and can choose a license based on the, the sort of most simplified version of the information. Um, so that's a good reference. It's a good resource to use. Um, uh, but yeah, for, for people that don't, a lot of times it's because they don't care. It's something very small, um, which is a lot of stuff on GitHub, little scripts or things like that, and they just don't think it's, it's necessary. But I've seen a ton of things where people send pull requests to add a license of some sort because they want to use it for something proprietary or they want to use it in some real way. Um, and so it's easier just to choose something, just find out what license you're comfortable with, if it's GPL, if it's MIT, if it's BSD, whatever. There's basically permissive or non, right? Figure out what you want and then just slap that into all of your projects all the time as a, a, a default state just to, to make it simple on everybody. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we end the day uh, with oh, this thank you. Uh, for those who have their thank art you, workshop sir. upstairs, I advise Ooh, you to go. Thank you now. a lot. Uh, also, <laughs> don't forget to come tomorrow. We'll have nice. Peter Sand and Josh Snyder with us, nice. and thank also you. Fenix Edu. So we expect to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.